that's what's so wonderful about teaching them at this point where they have the whole rest of the year to be giving you know anesthesia so by the time they're out they are comfortable we are so emotionally driven. We were we were hit with fear, right? We were hit with fear about that anesthetic. And so we, we hold on to that fear and it's like an idea of, okay, we have to let it go. The research is saying it's okay. It's okay, we can let that fear go and move forward with an appropriate medication. Most dentists get great injections, but there's this hurry up and learn it, get into clinic, and nobody's really watching as, as, as much as we do, I have to say, because I've seen it. And they're just put in there without that nurturing that we give every single student. And I think that that makes the, a better hygienist. Um, and even in the ones, again, on the weekend courses, if you need me, if you want any advice, if you need anything, feel free to contact me. Let me know how you're doing after you leave the course. So, you know, there's a support system there and a lot of pride. Get ready for your unofficial dental hygiene podcast. These are the tales of two hygienists, one East Coast RDH and one West Coast guy genist. Listen as they tackle the profession of dental hygiene with humor and enthusiasm. Now, please join Michelle Strange and Andrew Johnston as they tell you a tale of two hygienists. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of A Tale of Two Hygienists. This is your student-focused roundtable for the month. But before we get into the student roundtable, I want to give a huge shout out to Q Optics for their continued love and support of our dental hygiene students. You guys, if you have not looked up Q Optics yet, if you are not using loops yet, you need to make that phone call. You need to send out that email. Every clinician should be wearing loops. I was fortunate enough before this pandemic happened at Chicago Midwinter to be sized and measured for my loops myself. And I love them. There are many designs, many different styles, many different options. And right now, because it's been a little bit since we've been in this pandemic, there are many manufacturers creating face shields specifically for use with loops. And Q Optics is no exception. They have these amazing face shields designed for their loops. So don't let the pandemic frighten you away from delivering optimal patient care by using your loops. If you wanna know more, check out qoptics.com. And thanks again to Qoptics for their continued support with our students. Let's get into the student focus round table. So at the beginning of the student focus series that you, this was your brainchild uh, last year in 2019. Isn't that the year? God, there's yeah, flying back. It's the beginning of 2019. We're like, look, the students need a little bit more direction. We really value that. Like, we're so impressed you guys are even listening to this. Let's be Actually, honest. So true. Yeah. So like, let's give them something. They're, they're taking the time to listen to us. Let's give them something that they actually could use. And you came up with the idea of a round table and we brought on different people that would talk about one particular topic. And then I kind of hijacked it for 2020 and made it a little more researchy because that's what I do. But I hope that you guys find it helpful because what we're aiming to do is bring on people who understand the topic and let them explain to you how they're looking at research and applying it clinically. Because what happens is we graduate with the knowledge we graduate with, and it might be a little, uh, not, I want to say up to date. It might not be as up to date because they had to get you graduated, right? But there's stuff on like HPV that, you know, it's ever changing. And so we got to stay on top of that. And so we're going to bring the experts on so that we can teach you how to read the research and apply it to your patient care. So you can always be doing that up to date evidence based clinical practice that we talk about so much. And we hope you enjoy this student focused episode. Hey, Michelle. Yeah. It's time for the interview. Oh, but I had something else to say. We need to let the experts talk now. Fine. Well, welcome to the Student Focus Roundtable. I so much enjoy these, um, mostly because I learn a little something, something each time. Because uh, we know we have students listening and we know we have veterans. And we even have quite a few uh, not even in school yet. Like they're like, oh, dental hygiene sounds fun. Let me learn a little bit about it. So um, that's a thing that I will tell you guys as well, that it's on this wonderful round table. You're welcome to break it down for us to <laughs> the even most elementary uh, level because they, we have all kinds of people listening. But I want to invite Tina Clark and Marion uh, Mansky. Did I say that correct? I love to yes. butcher a simple last name. So I'm glad I got that 
Ray. So thank you so much for joining us. And we're going to talk anesthesia. And I want, I would love Tina, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are and where you're at. So, hey guys, yes, I'm Tina Clark and I am on the West Coast in Oregon and a very progressive state in what hygienists can do, especially when it comes to anesthesia. I've been a hygienist for 20 years and an educator for over 14 years now. And during that time frame, anesthesia kind of became my little baby and I've been known to be the go-to person for that in my area for all things needle oriented. So it's a, it's a, it's a true passion of mine. I love it. And I get asked so many questions from students, from hygienists, from the layman who's getting ready to go into the dental office, all about it. So I'm really excited to be here today. Thanks, Michelle, for inviting me. Yes, of course. And also welcome, Marion. How are you? Michelle, thank you. Thank you for having me. And it's great that I have a West Coast colleague because I'm East Coast here in Connecticut. And I um, have been teaching local anesthesia. Oh my gosh, since 2006, I was instrumental in the law passing in the state of Maryland. I was on many committees, met much testifying, fought very hard to get it in that state. And here I am in Connecticut now at the phone school, dental hygiene. I'm the director of the program. Um, so local anesthesia is also my passion. It's interesting how we really i really got into this and it's it's my most favorite topic um and it seems that we're very passionate about it because we work so hard to get it in the first place so and we take it very very seriously and uh you know being uh, a professor in a dental school at maryland and now here at phones i can see the passion is the same and so appreciative by hygienists and i do love teaching it so uh that is my passion also so we got east coast west coast passion here tonight love it and uh, Bones is my master alma mater, my master's degree. I loved my education over at Bones, uh, such a great school. So I'm gonna jump into some one of the hard questions. I'm just curious, how many people have you killed with uh, giving anesthesia? <laughs> None, <laughs> zero. Yeah, you know, that's always like, everybody's afraid of that, right? They're like, oh my gosh, but yeah. It, yeah. it's it's not as scary as we think. <laughs> yeah. Totally zero. And believe it or not, in, in Maryland, the law first passed and we had to negotiate and we only had infiltration at first. And that was the negotiation. And two years later, I was president. I said, we're getting we're getting blocked. And sure enough, don't you know that somebody showed up at, uh, you know, the hearing uh, saying, oh, those hygienists are going to kill people with block. <laughs> I was like, really? I mean, oh seriously, gosh. and it wasn't a dentist. It was actually an anesthesiologist. So oh. very interesting. Uh huh. Yeah. Wow. Someone who wasn't very educated in the process of the anesthesia of the oral cavity then, huh? That's right. That's yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sadly in South Carolina where we can only give infiltration. I have never blocked anybody. Um, so even thinking about like now going back and learning, I kind of uh, feel for the students and I kind of like remember back my first time of like, oh, the first time I gave, you know, anesthesia and stuck a needle in somebody's mouth, which I'm also curious, like, is this, are we still practicing on people? Um, <laughs> we always had anesthesia on a Friday afternoon and all of us would go home with like half our face numbed up. And I'm like, there's gotta be a better way. Then we got, then we got, we found carbocaine and it was all better, but we were doing the lidocaine with Epi and I'm like, oh, this no, oh my gosh, no, this is some foolery. No, I mean, we, we started out with lidocaine plain, which came in a cartridge and that's no longer available. Yeah. So now it's carbocaine, but we, we did lidocaine plain and that was easy, very easy enough. It wore off so quickly, but we have to do it on real people. I mean, we did don't because of COVID right now, we did the least uh, possible interactions between each other for this, for the local anesthesia labs that we we just have finished last week. Um, and they did use a SIM head and, you know, but there's no muca buckle fold. There's no, you know, it's, it's just different. You have to, you have to do it on each other. And, uh, nursing looks at me like we're crazy. I said, sorry, you know, we, we this is something we have to do. Um, it's critical for, for learning. Yeah, there really isn't anything you can find that mimics what it's like to go through mm -hmm. through human tissue and all the different variations of human tissue throughout the uh, the mouth because injecting in the maxilla is a lot different than injecting in the max mandibular area and trying to replicate that 
with a mannequin is just, it's virtually impossible. Yeah, agreed. I mean, keratinized tissue on the palate versus mucobuccal fold, totally different. Mm -hmm. Mandibular block going in 20 to 25 millimeters. You just, you just cannot simulate that. You can use the mannequin just so far and then you need to do the real deal. And the dental students used to call it stab lab, which I do not allow my hygiene students to say that, but that's what, oh, I'm going to go to stab lab. <laughs> you, can, you can't make them stop it. Yeah. And we've been, we've been increasing the number of injections. It used to be, oh, you would only do one or two at the most on your partner. And, and now it's like, okay, you're going to do four injections today <laughs> on yeah. the right side of the mouth, just to be able to, again, limit that exposure time and, and maximize, maximize that. Well, I think the more practice, the better for sure. I was so lucky to go into a surgical practice after, and I was a surgical assistant and a hygienist. And the doctor, like we anesthetized all, like sedated, I should say, the patients. And so I got a lot of practice on sedated patients, which was truly fantastic. And I really learned a lot about my technique. I got rid of that shaky hand of like, oh my God, it's coming for you, which I don't know why I could not seem to manage. Do you have any tips or tricks for like that technique and like how to, to calm the nerves a little bit as they're going in and doing those injections? Yeah, one of um, when I first started working with the students with this, you know, they have a speech they're supposed to say, right? I'm at my site of insertion or my point of penetration. One of one of those words, and you know, their hands are are literally shaking like a butterfly wing. And I'm like, okay, pick a spot, <laughs> right? You know, pick one of those spots. But you know, really, when it comes down to it, when you're first learning, don't have coffee right before lab. You know, you don't want you don't want to have anything like that or any energy drinks. But take some really nice deep breaths. Make sure you've really reviewed your anatomy, that you've reviewed the injection, that you can visualize the entire thing happening. Because if you aren't 100% confident with where you're going, that's just going to increase all of that anxiety. So reassuring yourself, uh, this is one of the courses where you just can't kind of, oh, I'll figure it out when I get there kind of a thing. You have to be prepared when you come in. And then once you're there, you know, feeling confident enough to actually relax your hand and stabilize your barrel. Oftentimes when clinicians are first learning, when students are first learning, you know, they have that lip pulled so far away that they don't have any, an extra kickstand of stability to be able to provide themselves for something. We, um, we also use the bald needle. It's called the safety needle mm -hmm. to practice with first. It, it is just a little rubber ball on the end of the the needle and it really does help because using a cotton tip applicator prior to to find your anatomical landmarks is great but actually holding a actual syringe getting comfortable with that feel and knowing that it's not the tip of the needle yet i'm practicing i'm practicing does alleviate a lot of stress for the students and i say you're going to mimic this mimic this exactly like you're going to give the injection even when they put the topical on and say you're mimicking how you're going to give the injection so it gets them very comfortable in that area and of course we're right there over their heads the entire time if i have to have my hand guide and hold i do that it does calm them it does uh, help the students a lot and and that's what that's what's so wonderful about teaching them at this point where they have the whole rest of the year to be giving you know anesthesia so by the time they're out they are comfortable they have given so many injections and i i encourage the inferior alveolar nerve block i want them mastering the mandibular block because if they master that it's all a piece of cake the rest of it so that that's the one that's so critical and a lot of hygienists avoid it because yeah. they're not comfortable with it and and those of us that are able to teach it and and hone it in to with our students. We're, the students are so lucky. They don't realize how lucky they are. Rather than our hygienists who take it over a weekend course, it's a weekend course. You know, they got to depend on their doc or their fellow hygienist helping them through that that bump. You know, to get over the bump to get comfortable. So, you know, my students, I'm, I totally, I have a log for them. They have to keep. They have to do so many injections. They have to do comps next semester. They have to. They can't avoid it. Because if they do, they're not going to use it out in practice. And I do find that a lot of hygienists want to come back for the refresher. What do they want it in? Mandibular block. Yep. And, you know, I think it's important, you know, to cycle back to what you said about practicing on student partners is that I think you also learn a lot when you are the patient on what it feels like to have proper retraction and 
being able to explain, oh, this is what it feels like if you hit a nerve and be able to explain that to a patient. Because I think we all agree, like if you've experienced something personally, you can approach it to your patients in a much a different manner than if you're just like, oh, well, I've heard that this can happen. I do love sharing that with my patients when they're always like, I hate this. I'm like, listen, buddy, you know what I mean? These I got from a newbie. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is going to be a breeze. Don't worry. Just sit back, take a breath. So I'm curious, like, what are your favorite, like, tips and tricks that you teach and, like, for what in injections? I know that's kind of a very broad stroke uh, question, but, you know, like, if it's an IA, if it's a PSA, if it is, you know, a mental, like, what do you have any tips or tricks um, that even if a student's about to take anesthesia, they can kind of, you know, tuck back in their memory bank. Or if they're a, a veteran hygienist, they can go, oh, yeah, that's what I was supposed to be doing with that injection. Yeah, I think, as I was saying before, that that, to me, the critical one is the IA. The others are sort of slam dunks. You have the anatomical landmark. You can verbalize that to me. You see it right there. You got it. The IA, you've got to use the anatomical landmarks. Critical. You've got to feel the coronary notch. You've got to see the pterygoid mandibular rafe. You've got to see the horizontal line that it makes a perfect horizontal. You've got to see it. A lot of people will say, oh, well, there's the teardrop right there. I can see it. Well, guess what? That teardrop, you know, the drop in to the pterygoid mandibular fossa area could be all along that line. You've got to make sure you've got to pinpoint it. So to me, that's why I have them use the ball needle to make the line, to understand, to feel that notch, look at that rafe. Do you see see where you're going? Because you can't just guess that one. So that one to me is that anatomical landmarking is so, so critical. And if I got to work on it with them for a while before we start, that's not a bit, not, that's better than just sometimes I think they're guessing and you can't do that with that one. So, you know, a contralaterally, the other side of the mouth, you know, looking at that second premolar, the perfect spot. Now what happens if it isn't the perfect spot? What if you you're in the right spot, but you hit bone too fast. All these things we talk about beforehand. And then if it really happens, not to freak out or not to freak out on an aspiration. I'm glad it aspirated now because didn't you want you want to check that? Because a lot of students get very nervous and they see blood in the cartridge. Well, good thing it's there now when you're checking before you've given the injections, correct? Just little tips and, and thoughts, bevels, gauges, you know, the whole thing, just talking it out with them and getting them comfortable with the language is, is very helpful. You know, I really like palatal injections. People are always afraid of palatal injections. And oftentimes I think we forget that we, if we apply some really good pressure anesthesia, that that makes a huge difference for the patient's comfort because they don't, they, after that, after all that pressure, they know the patient won't necessarily feel as much of the prick or the poke as mm -hmm. they would with, if you just apply the topical there and kind of hold it. So, you know, I always encourage everybody to apply pressure when they're doing like a, a, a nasal palatine injection. I tell them, I was like, you know, squeeze that incisive papillae towards you and then slide the needle under it. It's like you're popping a zit and just get visualize popping a zit when you're giving that injection. <laughs> I say the same thing too. I say that too. And you know, Farenbach has a wonderful, I mean, her velvet touch. If you read an article, it's it's been there forever in RDH. It's velvet touch. It works. It, it is it is perfect because everybody says, oh, the pal of the pal, like I'm dreading it, I'm dreading it. And then they sit for it and they're like, that wasn't so bad. You know, it's pressure, but then it's, she bows the needle, uh, the bevel's pointed toward bone, bowing the needle, give a drop, straighten the needle, go in as you go in, give little drops of anesthetic while the non-dominant hand is doing the pressure. So all these things have to be thought about, but it works. So her mm -hmm. velvet touch, I am, I am a fan of that. And I think it's, yeah. it's a great technique and it works so well. However, I have to say that thank you for Articane. Okay. Septicane is the total. When, if you don't want to give your patient more injections, then guess what? PSA, MSA, ASA, septo, and you may not have to do a GP or an NP because it diffuses well through bone where the other ones don't, and you don't have to give a palatal injection. And many times, I'd say 85% of my patients, I don't have to give a palatal because of that drug. So it's, it's wonderful. I don't tell the students that because I want them to master the palatals, but we do go to Articane at times. I'm like, try this out and see what happens. So it is a wonderful, wonderful drug. <laughs> I have to echo that. I love Articane. And I do think that Articane and palatal injections together are a match made in heaven as well. 
I don't know if you teach this, uh, Marion, but the AMSA, the anterior middle superior alveolar injection, which is kind of like a hybrid, I guess you could say, is like basically right between the GP and the NP, but it takes care of the premolars to the midline, the palatal tissue and the facial tissue without impacting the lip, which is fantastic for aesthetic dentistry, right? Or somebody that has to go to a meeting. But if you do that injection with septicane, Oh my gosh, it is, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. And, and I wish people used it more often, yeah. articane and that injection. So is there a place that you cannot use septo? Because I know when I first was <laughs> learning and back in 2005, there was some no-nos along with that and like allergies and things like that. So what it, what's, the, what's the deal today? It depends upon which resources you're looking at. I will tell you that. I will say that a lot of research is coming out kind of debunking the concerns about paresthesia and the inferior alveolar injection and mandibular blocks. There's still some people who are nervous about it, but there is a lot of new research coming out saying it's not as scary as we think, and it's actually a lot uh, more effective and efficient. Marion, right, do you see, agree? Yeah, I totally agree. In fact, what was in my head when we were talking about septo was septo got a bad rep. And the reason why is because it came out and, you know, Articane came in the United States in 2000. And all the other drugs, Articane's been the gold standard since 1948. So you've got a new drug on the market. Oops, paresthesia happened. It must have been the Articane. And that's called the Weber effect. And, and, and any new drug that comes on the market the first five years, any adverse drug effects is blamed on that new drug. And that's my, that's my take on it. Because really, when you think about it and you break it down, how could this happen? Okay, just with this one drug and not others. Now, it's a 4%. I'll give it that. But I don't see it. The research doesn't show it. Malamed debunked it years ago. 2008, he debunked it. So, but there's still this going trend. Oh, you can't use it for block. You can't use it for block. And I don't believe it at all. I think it's a fantastic drug. I think, you know, it rivals lidocaine at this point. And I don't see any problems with using it. As far as the allergies, that was incorrect also. That doesn't play out either. So, yeah. Tina. <laughs> so the funny thing is, is I, I've been researching Articane because I get a lot of questions about it. And I found out that the reason why so many people were afraid of it is because a lawyer started sending out letters to dental offices, just saying, without any factual evidence, saying this could, you could get sued if you use this anesthetic. And it was all came from a letter that went out. Um, from a lawyer uh, without any kind of research behind it. And what's the, what are we going to do as soon as we hear that? Like, we're going to freeze and be like, oh, okay, never mind. I'm pulling out. And right. so with anything that comes out like that, it takes a while for change to take place and for people to accept that change. You know, we are so emotionally driven. We were, we were hit with fear, right? We were hit with fear about that anesthetic. And so mm -hmm. we, we hold on to that fear and it's like an idea of, okay, we have to let it go. The research is saying, it's okay. It's okay. We can let that fear go and move forward with an appropriate medication. Exactly. Well, that is good to hear. I'm very, thank you guys for that information. The other trick that I was taught like by my doctor, and I'm curious if this is still a, a good technique was I give a little like few drops in and out, and then I go back for my big, bigger dose. How do you feel about that? So like, let's say I'm doing a mental, just throw a few drops in there, kind of let it settle and then go back in there. And the patients are like, oh yeah, I don't feel that at all. And so I can kind of sit there and kind of slow release the anesthesia and I'm good, they're good. And that was just something I was taught like very early on. And now it's like my go-to technique. I'm just curious if there is a, a pro or con or doesn't matter, just do whatever you're doing. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to, you're inserting twice, you insert, you drop, you pull out, let, wait, and then go back in. Mm -hmm. I just would go, why would you pull out? Why wouldn't you just okay. stay in there and right. like get, do a few drops and then just pause for a, a few seconds and then continue on? It's usually for my nervous patients <laughs> that are like borderline hyperventilating. I'm like a little drop, like, look, hard parts over with and chat them up. And then I kind of go back in. You don't feel that your fitness is all good. We're slow, deep breath. <laughs> Get that calm voice. 
And they always do so much better with that. And I think once I did had a real successful nervous patient, it's just always been kind of my go-to technique. Um, maybe not always, but definitely lean towards that. Um, especially if I'm giving like multiple sites, maybe I'll go like whoop, 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 and then kind of go back and they don't feel it. And I can do like a nice slow release, do my aspiration, do all my stuff and they feel none of it. Yeah. I haven't seen anything in the literature about that, but I have no. seen techniques from dentists say, try this. Okay. And these things yeah. come from what my colleague said works and my colleague says works, whereas the evidence in the books are, it's not there. You know, I do do that with a palatal injection only because that keratinized tissue is so hard to, to get anesthetized with topical that I do as I go in. I don't come back out. I, once I'm in, I'm in. I don't want to come mm -hmm. back out again. Once I'm in, I will give little drops as I'm heading toward the bone on a palatal it, and, and with the pressure with my non-dominant hand uh, doing it at the same time, and it seems to help. But as far as uh, what you're talking about, I, I don't I don't typically do that. Like, you know, like Tina said, once I'm in, I'm in. I'm not coming out again. I don't want to re-inject the patient. You know, that tip is sterile. It's in tissue. I want to keep it there and, and do my thing. And you're also not going so deep with the mental as opposed to, you know, I, maybe I could see it as a going toward the IA, but I don't even do that. No, um, and you, I, even, I even with the IA going in, I've also heard, well, you, you, you'll do half, you know, cartridge and come out and give a little bit more to, to get the lingual. There's no way you're not going to get the lingual ever. You're always going to get the lingual. It's the IA you might miss if you don't get it on target because the lingual is more anterior. So that, that I've heard too. I'm like, no, nope, I give my three quarter cartridge dose, come out, give my long buckle and I'm done. So um, th that is why South Carolina needs nitrous oxide sedation so that your patient who's anxious is gone and you don't have to worry about that. You do have we it. Do. We do. Okay, good. Yeah. We've had that, nitrous. That's amazing. You got nitrous and not blocked. Ah, oh, girl, <laughs> like, please, let me just yeah. tell you, I'm, I'm fighting with them now because they don't uh, think myofunctional therapy is a good idea mm -hmm. for us in South Carolina because apparently we're not smart enough. I don't know. I'm like, oh, my goodness. It's yeah, a, a I never am. ending battle. Oh, and teledentistry. Like, it's I'm like, can, can we just why don't you just say I, you don't want us to do good things for our patients? <laughs> I hear you. I, 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 that's why when I was in Maryland, I did not want to wait for block. I said, if we wait more than a year or two. We're not going to get it. And I just, I said to all my students, I said, keep calling the dentist over to do the block. Keep calling the dentist over to do the block. Cause they're going to say, well, didn't you take a course on this? Yes, I did, but I can't do it in the state. Yes, I did, but I can't do it in the state. Or tell the patient, I'm going to have to give you X amount of injections as opposed to, you know, so it really worked. It really worked. We had a nice little coalition going on because I just didn't see the point of it. I would have to literally give infiltrations or wait for the doctor to come over. And I just said, I'm going to keep calling the doctor over. They're going to get sick of it. And they did. And it worked. <laughs> well, I mean, and it's amazing that you haven't killed anybody. <laughs> <laughs> not going to happen. Nope, it's not. And there's been so <laughs> many people doing it successfully for so, so long. I'm just curious for, from a student perspective, is there not just so much technique, but even just knowledge base that is always a little harder for them to understand or grasp or anything that you can think of that comes to mind? Yeah, I would say outside of the injection technique itself, it's, I really have to work a lot with students about dosaging and figuring out how to properly dose and selecting the correct anesthetic for a patient, depending upon their health conditions. You know, those are uh, kind of bigger questions, a lot of critical thinking. And then of course, you know, when you have to throw math in, in there as well, that was enough to make anybody just go, peace out, I'm done. <laughs> Not right. me, right? <laughs> like I thought I only had to count to 32. I'm done. <laughs> right. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. The math, every, every time I give this course, I'll say, don't we, did we choose dental hygiene because we love math? No, we hate math, you know, because of the changing it from milliliters to milligrams that, that, uh, is, is on the, um, I don't, the CDCA board, local anesthesia exam that we have to take here on the East coast in some States. It's the calculations and they have to learn it for the, and they're just, they're just, they're just terrified. I'm terrified of it. The one thing that I do see that students can't understand is the bevel the bevel drives them crazy. You know, the bevel toward bone, the bevel should point toward bone. Now, if I'm holding it and doing the upper right, where would the bevel be facing me or facing you? And they just can't understand it. So I'm always walking around with either straws from like for smoothies that have a bevel edge or the high speed suction tip, you know, just to use that to show it as now here's the bevel because that's a hard thing for them to really grasp. 
and understand of that pointing the bevel toward bone. If it's, you know, a, a mandibular right IA, where's the bevel face? If it's, a you know, upper left, where does it face? If it's a palatal, they don't get it. And a lot of times that's what I'm doing. I'm sitting there with a big high-speed suction tip and showing them this is the bevel. That That is one thing every single class, they don't grasp bevel. I don't know, Tina, do you find that too? Yeah, I do. And, and, and you know, I like your idea of the uh, the straw with them. Yeah. Like, I might go have to hit up Dairy Queen for one yeah. of their, like, spoon straws or something like yeah, that. Yeah, and we got three different and... sizes. We got three different sizes so they can see 25, you know, 25, 27, 30. So they can understand the difference in how big it is and how small, much smaller it gets and right. the deflection. So we have three different sizes. Oh, so for the gauge and everything. Yeah. 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 For the gauge and the, and the, and the lumen opening and the, and what a bevel is. So that's what we do. It works, but Smart. it takes some time till they get it. They're, they're just trying to think, okay, window always faces me. Big window always faces me, but that bevel, hmm, you know, that's, that's a little tricky for them at first. Yeah. You know, and I think some of the other kind of just, you know, oh, aren't you sweet moments like, oh, sweetheart. Is it this, in the South we say, bless your heart. Is that what you say? Right. Yes, oh, yes, bless we your do. Heart. <laughs> right. Is, you know, when they get all set up and, and they have their cartridge in backwards, there's always one of those moments and <laughs> they're like, oh my gosh, nothing's coming out. It's like, well, that's one of the reasons why we test our flow rate before we get going. It's a, another way to self-check to make sure we put the cartridge in the correct way. <laughs> right. Because, you know, and, you know, and I have seen even the most seasoned clinician do that. You know, we get into a, a, a hurry where we're trying to turn things around. We have to, you know, do more and more and more injections and you don't even pay attention. And you all of a sudden you realize that you put the stopper on the wrong end. So, yeah. Whoopsie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm actually fascinated by the bevel because I'm always like, uh, is it because it's easier for insertion with the bevel turned? I, I don't know. What do you think is the the barrier there? It, it probably is the most critical for the IA because how deep you're going in and you got to get to the bone. But it's just a matter of how the technique is taught. Mm. You know, in Malamed's book, Bevel Toward Bone. So, you know, we yeah. use the guru and we go with it and bevel toward bone. And, and at first you can't teach any gray areas. It's got to be black and white and you've got to teach it that way. Now, what they do out in practice, they do out in practice, but that bevel is something I want them to understand. And, and it's pointed toward the area where I want it to go. You know, it's coming out in the area I want it to be near that nerve. So that's my rationale of why, why it's pointed that way. Yeah. And I'll tell my students, you know, depending upon the injection, it may not be as, as critical. Like if you're doing a maxillary infiltration, like an ASA, MSA, it's, it may not be as critical, but if you're doing like, say a nasal palatine, you really want to pay attention to the, where that opening is, because if it's the, if that opening, if your bevel opening isn't towards the foramen, if it's towards the tissue going down towards the tongue, like that solution is going to, all that pressure is going to go right into the mouth instead of up into that foramen. So it, it can on that kind of injection, make or break the success of it. So I would have to say it is injection specific where you really want to make sure you're paying attention to it. I would love to just finish up our conversation around uh, percutaneous injuries and the importance of like sharp safety. That is always the one thing where I'm like, even when I watch some, like uh, I watch pimple poppers videos because I'm a weirdo like that. And I watch them with their sharps technique. And I'm always like, Oh, did you pull the cap off like that? Don't do that. And then I see my students. I'm like, all right, y'all going to do this one time. You did it. It's out of your system. <laughs> We're going to figure this out. You're going to do it. Even if you have to do this 47 times in my presence, you're going to become unconsciously competent because like that's the last thing you want is to stick yourself with a needle like that. That's just, it's embarrassing. It hurts and it's a lot of anxiety. So we don't mm -hmm. want to do it. Do you guys have any um, conversations, fear mongering, scare talk? I don't even know. What, what is your uh, recipe for success against uh, sharp safety? 
I would say, you know, we really want to get into the practice of, of course, single-handed recapping. And, you know, if you can recap without anything on holding your cap, you know, there's all the different cap holders, but if you can get that scoop technique down, you know that you're going to be able to recap anywhere, anywhere, anywhere. It doesn't matter. But I do want to say one of the words of caution with sharps and disposal is I did have a student one time who she was had already dismantled her syringe. Everything was great. And she went to the sharps container and to throw her needle away. And the sharps container was kind of full. And so she set it in. It didn't go down all the way. And she took her hand unconsciously and tapped down on top of the opening and stuck herself with the back end of the needle and I punctured, there was blood coming. And it was a really, really big scare, especially because we knew that the source patient was HIV positive also. So that even just heightened everybody's concerns even more. I mean, it turned, you know, good. It, there's, a, oh, there's a happy ending and there was no issues, no problems, but it was enough to make everybody go, okay, what are the engineering mechanisms in place to assure that this doesn't happen again? And, you know, I just really want people to really look at their sharps container, see how full it is <laughs> before you put it in. And, and if, you're, if your sharps don't go down all the way, don't tap the top, grab a locking plier or cotton tip, uh, cotton tip pliers and see if you, if you need to maneuver something around, maneuver it around and then go grab a new sharps container. Both yeah, Marianne at, at our like, no. Yeah, I was like, oh no. Yeah, at, at our school, we use the protector card. We start with the protector card um, and get them used to that first. And they have to do the one-handed. Many a times they want to start grabbing that card. It's like thumbs never go in front of that card ever. You can you put the needle into the into the cap, then you may touch the back of the card where the where the needle cap is. And it is a very hard thing to get them used to because they just want to hurry up and put it back or they're sitting there giving the injection and they're starting to talk to you and I'm staring at the needle, like make your needle safe, make it safe first and then we'll talk and really getting them to understand the importance that one handed scoop or whatever they use, they cannot ever do this two handed ever, ever. And they do it first. And then right away, it's like, stop. What did you just do? Let's think about this. Oh, 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 I get it. I get it. And just to really instill that in them so early and fast, stop everything and just stop and let's talk about it because I don't want them getting stuck. I don't want anything happening to them. It is painful and it does cause huge anxiety, as you said, with other, with the patients, uh, you know, who needs it, who needs to go get tested, who needs this, that, and the other. So just using that, that protector card seems to help at first. And then if they use the janker or they use the scoop technique, whatever they use, it, they get it, but it, it, you've got to be an eagle eye with them at first because they don't know. You know, it's like first time using a scaler or, or a curette. They don't know, you know. So um, that's that's why I say the luxury of students getting this course the entire year, you know, or longer. They just get it by the time they're out. They, they're, they're very good at it. Um, the hygienists that take the course, we instill it as best we can over that weekend and, uh, you know, hoping they get it too. And I'll stop with, I'll stop with them too. Like, stop, back up. What did, what do we just do here? Oh, I just touched it. Yep. Let's talk about why we, we're not going to do that. So just something you got to keep instilling in them. So you said something and it made me wonder how many times have you had to do a full on Keanu Reeves matrix move when a student is coming out of the mouth and going to like put it on the tray where you're just like all of a sudden dodging. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah, no, uh, let's make that safe first. Then we'll talk. Right. <laughs> Like how low is like we're doing the limbo. How low can you go? Right. Yeah. Just trying yes. to avoid that needle. Yes. Oh, they're so excited. They want to talk about it. Like, let's, let's, let's cap first and talk. I, yeah. They're like, I did it. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> and I would even build upon that with, you know, having a mom in the room or having, uh, you know, a, a caretaker or somebody else in there that wants to be there holding their hands. And I'm always like, yes, but I'm just, would feel a little better with some distance here. Yeah. And, and in that situation, if you do have somebody that is like adamant that they have to be there, you know, I try to counsel them like, let's not talk about what you're seeing because we work really hard to keep it out of the patient's view. Right. So if we, if, you know, they go to uncap the needle, right. And, and you're doing an IA with that nice long needle. And if that caretaker is going, Oh my gosh, that's so, that's such a long needle. You're putting that in their mouth. That's not a good way to, <laughs> uh, 
cause comfort for that patient. <laughs> yes, I totally agree. And so I, do you have any good verbiage that the student could use while giving the injection, like to calm their patient? Um, is there any like specific, uh, I mean, always like, you know, we're going to keep our hands down, you, you know, you kind of learn like, I'm going to get it in front of those hands. Mine's always like, we're going to take nice deep breath in through our nose and like slow deep breath out, remind you to breathe. But I'm just curious, what's your like feel to the patient? Yeah, I like to, I do that as well. Like talk to them about taking nice deep breaths and trying to find their happy place. Uh, oftentimes uh, I try to have that conversation beforehand. Like where do they really, what's their happy place? And like uh, pretend you're, you know, on the beach in Maui or you're, you know, sitting poolside, start trying to do some visualization talk through with them and just remind them of how well they're doing. And we're almost done with the injection and, and you're doing great. Those kinds of positive affirmation types of things. So what I do too, is I also talk to the patient. I'm watching also what they're up to, watching their hands, watching their face, uh, looking at them all the time. So, you know, it's not going to take very long. It's, we're almost there. You're doing great. A lot of talking to them while we're doing it. But I, I'm mainly looking at everything about them. What, what's their facial? What are they doing? What's the nonverbal cues? And if they are, you know, very anxious about it. I mean, in my state of Maryland, when I lived there, we did have nitrous oxide, which was great to have. Here in Connecticut, we don't have it. And so I don't have that luxury of that anxiety patient really giving that to them prior to. But I think the talking and being calm, getting everything out of the way, the last thing I want them to see is anything, you know, the syringe. I don't want them to see anything when they come into the operatory. It's covered up that they don't see that because it's huge. I mean, the, the, that syringe is very different looking than a flu shot syringe, and it has to be. We need we need it for visual. We need that to get into a dark aura cavity. But um, so I, I cover it up as best, you know, it's covered. They don't see it. I come in from the side. You know, some students, when they're first doing it, they're holding it up in the air and they're just going right in there. So I just tell them, you know, you, you need to come into the side just very calmly and talk to them. This will only take me a little bit of time. You're doing great. We're going nice and slow and steady and then take it out. And and I got to tell you again, and I'm being biased because I'm a hygienist, the patients typically say, wow, I didn't even feel that. That's not how it was prior to a hygienist doing it. And again, you know, I was at Maryland right at the start when loft just passed. And that's what I kept hearing. Wow, this didn't even bother me. This was wonderful. Thank you so much. It was so gentle. I'm like, yep, we got that. We got that. <laughs> yeah, I think we can all agree hygienists give way better shots. I really do. <laughs> yeah, we do. I like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. It's broken like, down to such a science because, again, we fought for it. We know how many hours it has to be. We are vigilant to make sure we're all doing the right things. We're proud of what we do. And look, you know, dent, some dentists give, most dentists give great injections, but there's this hurry up and learn it, get into clinic, and nobody's really watching as as, as much as we do. I have to say it because I've seen it. and. They're just put in there without that nurturing that we give every single student. And I think that that makes the, a better hygienist. Um, and even in the ones, again, on the weekend courses, if you need me, if you want any advice, if you need anything, feel free to contact me. Let me know how you're doing after you leave the course. So, you know, there's a support system there and a lot of pride. Marion, wouldn't you say that uh, any dentist that you've worked at in the school system, after they've seen the education that all of the hygiene students are getting, they're going, wow, we never got that kind of detailed information. And you guys really do know what you're doing. I hear that on a regular basis from every single doctor that I've ever worked with in the yeah. school setting. Yeah. Uh, what we did too, before the law passed in Maryland, we I got permission from the state board to teach it in a lab situation. So kind of like the weekend course or the courses that we do for the students, they work on each other. So what I did was I, I did that course with my hygiene students 2006 to 2010. And I asked the state board of dental examiners, dentists to come be our attendings because technically by law, we could not oversee those injections being given, hygienists, because it didn't pass yet. So I asked the State Board of Dental Examiners, the Dental Association dentists to come and be the attendings. And I'm telling you, that really kicked it in because they got to see how hard those students and us, how we worked and taught. And they really left that saying, this is great. This is a great course. And so it was, you know, a struggle to get the law passed because it was infiltration first, but it was a step and it is in 
little step by step, we got what we wanted. But I think having them there and realizing these hygienists can do this, they're great at it. You know, we're that caring, nurturing uh, professional. It just comes natural to us. So I think that worked well. <laughs> it's like to have political savvy every now and again. It's absolutely the case. You have to have a little, a little, little smoothing there a little bit. So just to wrap this up, I'm curious if you have any pieces of advice for the students as they're learning about anesthesia. This is a very important thing that we have to learn. We have to learn the math. We have to learn all the details about dosage. It's super critical. But there's a lot of people that are really nervous going into it. Um, any words of advice for them? I think Tina said it. I do think Tina said it at the beginning that take it seriously. Listen to what you're getting taught. Read, look at the anatomy. Um, there's lots of videos out there these days. Uh, we, we have one we made, a colleague and I from Maryland made it with dense Blycerona on YouTube, Max Layer Mandibular Injections. We just did them two years ago. Look at them, watch it, listen, L look at the visuals, get it in your head, visualize in your head where you're going and what you're doing because that's, that's what it's all about. And, and know that you have the support and you can do this. And I always say to the students after the first injection, so what do you think? Oh, that's all it is? That's all it is. It's okay. That's that first injection that they're the most worried about. And of course the inferior alveolar because they're going so deeply. But by the time they get to the IA, they've already done all the maxillary injections. They're already comfortable. It's the first one. And the first time they do it and they realize I got this, and then, then that pride and that comfort level comes and they know that they got the support and then they're, they're, they're into it. And I'm glad when I see that, that light bulb go on and knowing that, okay, yet another one we got, you know? Um, so I think it's, it's it, Tina said at the beginning, read, look, ask questions, visualize, put it in your head, say it in your head what you're doing. And I always say that to students, say it in your head what you're doing, but how, how, where you're going, what you're going to go by, what you've got to be careful of, what's the bone you're going to hit if you're going to hit a bone. You know, so I think that just that whole language of anesthesia, they become more comfortable with it. And then it's just part of it. And then they're excited to do it. I mean, like I said, we just did anesthesia lab last week. I already got my students giving injections, IAs. I'm like, whoa, you know, and they're doing it. So I'm happy to see that. Yeah, along with, as you know, we've been saying about, you know, studying and, and, and really reviewing, but I tell all my students, this is one of the things that you can do to really be empowered and know that you can treat your patients and provide them with the highest quality of care when you're going through and you are removing all of that yuck and gunk below the gum line, right? We're doing all of this stuff that isn't the most uh, relaxing thing that when, when you can confidently give an injection, then you can go through and you can be the best clinician, the best therapist out there, knowing that your patient is comfortable and you can remove all of that deposit in a, an effective manner. So that really helps to like empower them to be like, oh, I this is awesome and great to do. And I also want to encourage them uh, to have fun with it too. It is very serious but you gotta have some fun. You know, take those selfies of when you've got the droopy lip or when you're drooling or, you know, be like, yeah, I, I can understand why you wouldn't want to call it stab lab, but you know, it's, <laughs> that's one of the ways that, that is kind of to release some of the anxiety and tension is to find the fun in it. You know, have those silly moments and pause every once in a while to take that Charlie's Angels photo of you holding a syringe back to back with your classmate going, yeah, that's right. And do those things because that's what helps making surviving hygiene school fun right, is when we get to have those silly special moments. And then when you are, you know, five years down the road, you're going back and remembering those crazy antic times. Right. Oh, there are many pictures of that. There are many, they, they now videotape themselves while they're in the chair and, you know, they're recording themselves with their phone and, and yes, taking the picture with the, you know, fat lip there and, and knowing that, that that student's anesthetized. But yeah, it did they do have a good that's why I always say to students, and look at this slide. They did they do have a good time in like local anesthesia labs. <laughs> it is and it is true. It's empowering. It's expanding your scope of practice. And that's a pride in itself that you are now amongst those who've expanded their scope. And that's you know that's we're all about we're lifelong learners. That's who we are. Love it. Well thank you so much for all of this information. And if anybody has any follow-up questions, how can they find you? 
So you can find me at my website. It's teachertinardh.com. And I have some anesthesia hints and tips there for you all as well, like a little guide uh, guide sheet for you. And of course, on Facebook, Teacher Tina RDH and Instagram, Teacher Tina RDH. I love that. I'll have to do that. I'm going to have to find that. I'm at uh, Bridgeport. It's M Mansky, M M A N S K I, at bridgeport.edu. Uh, I'm on Facebook, Marion Mansky. I'm on Instagram also, so wherever you can find me. Uh, but yeah, feel free to contact me. I, I'm always there to, to help and give little tips and advice and to share and commiserate if need be. <laughs> 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 we need that sometimes. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much for all the advice and information that you shared with us. Um, I even learned quite or was reminded of a few things. It's been a minute since I taught anesthesia, like five, <laughs> six years. So it was needed. And hopefully one day I will be able to give an IA block in the state of South Carolina. Yeah, I, I hope so. I just, it drives me crazy how they, some states don't even have it. I'm just so sad, saddened for those hygienists yes. who are just struggling with, you know, Texas, Georgia, North Carolina, I just, in Delaware. I just, what, what's going on? You know, it's, I know. Not, it's I, 2020. Seriously. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I find the silver lining that my neighboring states can't. So I'm like, woohoo, yay for me. At least I can give something. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, well, when it happens, here. we'll have to come there and pop some champagne and celebrate uh, with you. And, right. and, and you can, you know, we, woman after my heart. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we could, we can, uh, we can practice some shots, quote unquote. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. We can. <laughs> and you always have some colleagues that can come testify for you guys. I would love it. Love to Ooh. testify for you guys in South Carolina, but um, yeah, I, the, the saving grace and the silver lining is that or that drug we talked about, that septicane. I'm telling you, you can give an infiltration. And it, I, I had number 19 infiltrated by a dentist and I was anesthetized all the way <laughs> to number 26. And it, it was pretty strong. So, you know, there's a silver lining of that drug again. It really is, is pretty amazing. So mm -hmm. in the meantime, but in the meantime, I'm, I'm, I'm there to travel when we can to do any testifying, writing, uh, writing of uh, support, things like that. We've, we've done it for other states. Happy to do it. Well, that's great to know because I am, I would love to see more reciprocity across this country. I know there are some hindrance between like what some states learn versus some other states. And there, there's a lot of in calibration issues uh, within is. the faculty world. But the reality is that for me to not be able to, <laughs> cross my state line. I just feel for those people that live on the borders. And I'm like, well, in this on Monday and Wednesday, you work in North Carolina. Mm, sorry. Right. It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. What is amazing, though, is all the court, every hygienist I've talked to that teaches the course, we all talk the same. We all speak the same language on how we teach the course. You know, and, and it is amazing how calibrated hygiene faculty are from school to school. I mean, I've, I've been to two schools already teaching it and we're all the same, speaking the same language. I'm talking to Tina and I'm hearing the same words I say, you know, so I know that we're teaching it all the same. It's just states' rights get in the way, you know, states' rights is states' rights. Now they can do what they want. But, you know, why is it in medicine that they can travel from state to state and not have to do what we have to do? It just, it baffles the mind. I don't know about your state, Tina, are you mannequin state for your, for your clinical mannequin or, or live patient? Right. So for the state of Oregon, the board has uh, an OSCE for licensure for right now. It's a temporary ruling and it's still under review. There is a mannequin, it's a mannequin-ish right now, but it could go back to being live patient we are we are actually in the middle of all of the all of the negotiations of all of that stuff so you know i think with anesthesia one of the reasons why we can all speak the same terminology walk the walk talk the talk is because it is such an exact science you know we are working with anatomical structures even though there's variations from person to person, those don't change. Um, the medications are standardized. You know, there's so many things that are standardized and it makes it easy to transfer that information from person to person because it is fairly black and white. And 
I know, hope, and dream that one day it will be super easy uh, throughout the nation for it to happen. But I think that's one of the reasons why it is so easy is because it is just a, it's a, it's a very black and white type of technique process. Yeah, it is. I I don't know, Michelle, in, in, in South Carolina, are they allowing mannequin exam or live patient exam for clinicals? Live patient. Patient. Yeah, we just switched to mannequin, well, due to COVID and, the, you know, what was going on. And we're not going back. This is it. It's mannequin all the way. So wow. mannequin has gone mannequin straight. Well, it was interesting because when it happened, uh, we were trying to get the governor to say, let's exempt them this year. That's crazy. They're never going to get a live patient. And then CDCA came along with the mannequin. And I looked at the law and it said written exam. And then it said um, practical clinical. Didn't say live patient exam. So I called up the board. I'm like, so uh, this could be a mannequin too, right? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> because there was no other way these poor students were going to get this done. And as an educator, as educators, I don't know what you think about it, but it's extremely subjective. The, the live patient exam, first of all, is stressful for the student. The patient, it's, <laughs> are they ever going to get finished? Is that the right thing to do? Um, and then there's too many variables that can happen from the moment they come in to the moment they leave. And it just was extremely stressful. Now they all start out with the same thing, the same thing. And I was amazed at how much less stress, calmness, it was just a different experience this year. And it was mannequin. So we'll see what happens. They're gonna be improving upon it in the next year or so, I'm sure. But uh, no going back in Connecticut, we're mannequin. (laughs) You know, Michelle, since we kind of talked about the board exams, Board exams, this is something I really want the listeners to understand is that with anesthesia and board exams, they really have to look for each state to see what the requirements are, because some states may not require a anesthesia board exam for licensure. Some states do require anesthesia board exam for licensure. Some states will require a certain number of injections along with the board exam for that licensure as well and and having a listing out of which injections did you do how many injections did you do and so when when we're looking at portability and the idea of anesthesia with that those are some of the some of the things that really need to be reviewed yeah exactly 100% yeah. And yeah, I just exactly. think it like it would be nice for us to all teach the same same criteria like let's just all I mean there's obviously going to be demographic changes. There's going to be equipment differences. There's going to be like patient population. Like there's all kinds of things that will be a variable that we'll not be able to control, but ultimately we can all be learning (laughs) something similar on the, you know, and then, then we can be tested the same. And I agree, like the stress that comes with the boards is just, it's out of control. I've seen some amazing students that I would be honored to have as colleagues fail just because yeah. it was a bad day. It was a, it was something right. happened. Somebody got the stomach flu while, and I mean, some of the most obnoxious things I'm like, how is this a thing still? Mm-hmm. So I, you know, I, I hope for that one day, but yeah, and I think and then, a lot of us talk about that on these round tables. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, and, and he's right. If you're going to come take a course and you need to have that license, uh, that local anesthesia certification in two states, make sure that you're, you're, you're knowing what you have to take. Cause example, Connecticut, I'm here in Connecticut. They don't have to take it, an exam after they take the weekend course and Monday morning, they're giving injections. Whoa, in Maryland, what? Yeah. 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 That's in Maryland, how it is in Oregon. Course, in so Oregon, that, yeah. In Oregon, it's just part of our licensure. We've been able to do anesthesia since I think it was 1975, 76. I get those years mixed up, but it is part of our licensure here for the state. So we have to be very forthcoming with our students when they're going to take their anesthesia board exam is that even though in the state of Oregon, you don't have to take it, you do need it for practically every other state that you uh-huh. go to. So you might as well do it now while all the information is fresh in your head. So there's pros and cons to that, right? Because a hygienist that maybe was trained in a state that doesn't provide anesthesia and maybe they didn't learn anesthesia can come in and, you know, if they wanted to, they could go ahead and, and provide provide some local anesthesia. So, you know, there's pros and cons to both. For sure. Yeah, some states make it great to, you know, cross lines and do anesthesia in their state and other states don't. I mean, I've had students take my course 
moved to a different state and they weren't allowed, they had to take the course all over again. Where in my state, we tried to make it very easy for a hygienist to come to our state and give anesthesia. They took the course, they've been, they proved they've been doing X amount of injections for so many years, they're t- they can do it here in, in the state. So, um, but I was surprised because yeah, I had to send a lot of paperwork to these states. And if you didn't have X amount of injections, even though they've been doing it for like two or three or four years, if they didn't have X amount of injections during the course, they made him take the course over again, which I thought, come on, really? It's like, it's like making me after 35 years, and I'd probably have to do it, have moved to another state, take my clinical board over again. It's, it's insulting, <laughs> truly. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you're in good standing, you can prove that you're doing it. Hey, have at it. But I don't know if that's a financial or why they do it, but it's just, it, I don't like it. <laughs> But it is what it is. So I just tell students where are you getting this certification, also your licensure. Make sure, you're, for instance, the practical exam. They might have to take a live patient exam. For instance, in your state, in Oregon, live patient exam. Pennsylvania, live patient exam right now. Or mannequin. So maybe you should take it in Pennsylvania where it's live, or take it here with a live patient. So yeah, to clarify, Oregon is OSCE with a typodont right now, right but now, maybe, right now. but maybe yeah, that's still yeah. It's in negotiations. <laughs> in negotiation. It. Well, in negotiation. Oh my gosh, I have learned even more outside of anesthesia. And even though I'm not super active in my uh, state, mostly because I hate speaking government, um, I have learned that I need to get over it because if we're not all on board, we're just going to be sitting back here in like mid century doing the medieval <laughs> stuff. I don't even know. Like, it's ridiculous. So I'm getting better about that. So it's nice to hear um, the pro- progress that you guys have made in your states and hear that there's hope out there for us that are a little behind in the times. Mm, it happens. West Coast seems to do things for it first, and then it trickles over to East Coast and it eventually gets around here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's that it engineering attitude. Yeah, right. <laughs> Exactly. Well, thank you so very much. Um, if you have any questions, listeners, please reach out to Tina or Marion. Uh, they are a wealth of knowledge. Obviously, you've heard that today. And check out websites and all that jazz. Thank you too very much for coming on and sharing all your knowledge with us. Thank, thank you, you, Michelle. It's been Exciting. awesome. I had a great time. Thank you. We hope you guys enjoyed this round table. Thank you to our guest for bringing all their advice and their research that they found for us. And again, follow us on Instagram, follow us on Facebook. You can always go to our website, Attila2Hygienist.com. We would love your feedback. And don't forget to share this episode and rate and review us on any of your listening apps. Thanks, everyone. Bye, y'all.